In this video, you'll learn how to properly ground and bond an off-grid system. So that means your inverter has no AC inputs at all. The AC output of the inverter is not connected to the house wiring. Instead, it's going to go through its own breaker box and its own outlet or outlets. Now, many people might call this an off-grid system. That doesn't mean you are living in a remote area, though you certainly could be. But this system could be used in a normal grid-powered house. Um, you might use it for a garage, an outbuilding, or any place that you would want to keep your solar-powered circuits totally separate from the grid-powered house circuits. Some inverters are internally bonded between neutral and ground. The neutral and ground are connected together. Usually this is done with a, a screw or two screws in the circuit boards that connect to the ground case. Some of these are unbonded. That's also called a floating neutral. The ground and the neutral are totally separate. Okay, let's look at the AC out connections on the inverter. Some inverters may look just a little different, but they're all pretty similar. Sometimes the ground is on a separate lug on the case. Uh, this is on a grow watt. The AC connections are on a terminal block. You connect your AC cables to the terminal screws. Um, you have a ground, a line, and a neutral for in, and then the same three connections for AC out. We aren't connecting any input wires, just the outputs. So just as a demonstration, this would be the ground wire and you stick it into the hole on the terminal and then you just tighten down the screw up above here. And you do the same for all three lines. Okay, so over here on the breaker panel or the load center, whatever you want to call it, um, our line one cable is going to come over to one of the two hot breakers. Um, the neutral is going to connect to the neutral bus and the ground wire is going to connect to the ground bus. Okay, so on a typical breaker panel or load center, you have two hot bus bars that are fed by these two terminals. So you bring your line one, line two into here. Now, in this case, we only have one line coming into it. So you could go to either one of these. These terminals feed the hot copper bus bars where the breakers plug in. Now the breakers alternate between line one and line two. So the first breaker is line one, second breaker is line two and so forth. If you're only wiring up 120 volt single phase system uh, with your inverter, you connect your line one and then use every other breaker. And there are two neutral bus bars, one here and one here. And this over on the side is the ground bus bar. Now, if you want to bond the ground to the neutral, you use this grounding screw, which you see right here, and tighten it all the way down. If you don't want to have it bonded, if you want this to be a floating neutral like a sub panel, then you pull the screw completely out. And if your breaker box doesn't have that grounding screw, you can just use a piece of wire and make a jumper um, between the ground and the neutral. Also, if you're going to be powering multiple circuits on multiple breakers, you want to put in a master or a main breaker. Back to our off-grid system. Let's remember rule number one. There can only be one neutral ground bond in your entire electrical system. This is the key to building your system correctly, and we will refer to rule number one many times in this video. So let's say that the inverter is already bonded. If that's the case, you have a bonded neutral there, then the breaker panel must not be bonded. And right here, we can also add our earth ground, also known as our grounding rod. We could also attach it to the grounding bus of the breaker, and sometimes that's easier. Okay, now let's look at a normally operating circuit. Um, and you'll notice that all of the electricity is going through line one in neutral. There's no energy on the ground wire. Now, if we have a fault and line one were to touch the grounding case, then that energy can flow along the ground wire or the equipment grounding conductor all the way back and up the bond and go to our neutral and then complete the circuit so that the breaker can trip and protect the circuit, turn everything off, and de-energize it. In fact, this is the whole purpose of the neutral ground bond and the ground wire, the equipment grounding conductor. That's to create a path 
that will trip the breaker during a ground fault. Remembering that we only have one neutral ground bond in our system, let's move it. So let, we'll take the inverter and make it not bonded or floating, and we'll bond over here at the breaker panel. We'll also move the ground, uh, our ground rod over there just for convenience. It's easier to hook it to a ground bus. Now let's look at what a normal circuit looks like going through the system. And again, notice there's no energy on the ground conductor. And if we have a fault, a ground fault, then just like before, it's going to come down our ground wire and it's going to use the bond to get to the neutral bus and then come back over and complete a circuit and the breaker pops, protects everything. So electrically, the results are the same, whether the bond is in the inverter or in the breaker panel. It's easier to wire things in the breaker panel. Um, and another advantage is if you decide to use multiple inverters, whether they're in parallel or they are in uh, split phase, you now have both of the inverters may have a ground bond and you have two ground bonds creating a loop. Speaking of which, exactly why can we only have one bond? Well, let's see what happens if we come over here on the inverter and add a bond. And we also bond the uh, breaker panel. We now have two ground neutral bonds. Let's see why we shouldn't do that. So let's turn on a normal circuit. And we've created two pathways now for the electricity to get back to the source. This ground wire is now carrying current when it should not be. It's energized, which means the cases of the breaker panel and the inverter are also energized, a very dangerous situation. Okay, I want to take a second to talk about the earth ground. Now in the electrical code, the earth ground is called the grounding electrode conductor. It helps to think of it as the grounding rod or the earth ground. Now in a ground fault, the current will flow through the ground wire, aka the equipment grounding conductor, and then through the neutral ground bus to return to the source and the inverter. Little current goes through the grounding rod. Most people think that the ground rod or the earth ground will clear a ground fault, but that is false. Uh, the ground's resistance is actually about 25 ohms or so, depending on the distance that it has to go. So using Ohm's law at 120 volts, that's only going to carry a less than five amps, uh, and it will not trip the breaker at five amps. So the grounding rod's purpose primarily is to dissipate large surges such as static charges and nearby lightning hits. So to wire up our off-grid system, the big question we have to answer is, is my inverter a bonded neutral or a floating neutral? And how do we test for that? We're going to use three tests. First, we're going to measure the resistance. Then we're going to measure voltages then we're going to use an outlet tester. Okay, so first we're going to measure the resistance. Um, with the inverter turned off, you're going to check for resistance between the neutral and the ground of the AC output terminals. Okay, if the uh, resistance is very low or zero, then the inverter is bonded. Um, if you measure, however, and it's a very high resistance or even like an open circuit, then it is not bonded. And that's test number one. Uh, next, we're going to turn the inverter on and we're going to measure some voltages. Um, I want to come back to this in more detail in just a moment. So number three was use an outlet tester. Okay, and there are many different brands of these kinds of outlet testers out there. And uh, the combination of lights could be different on different brands. Okay, and this outlet is connected to the uh, inverter and it is bonded properly right now. This is what it looks like with no bond, also known as a floating neutral. Uh, the tester shows a bad ground. Okay, let's go back to test number two, which is measuring voltages. And we're gonna go into uh, some more detail on that. With the inverter on, we're going to measure voltages across the hot, the neutral and the ground. Now we can do that either on the AC out terminals right at the inverter, or we can come over and check it right off of the breaker panel 
by measuring across the buses in the breaker panel. And then we also want to make sure that the breaker panel is not bonded. So we're trying to test to see if the inverter is bonded or not. If the inverter is bonded, these are the kinds of uh, voltages you would expect. So from line one or hot to neutral, you're going to see about 120 volts. Well, that makes sense because this is the current carrying cables, the live ca uh, circuit cables. Okay, and my grow watt system across line one in neutral, it's reading 119, just under 120. Okay, across line one to ground, we are also going to read 120 volts, and that is due to the bond. So the ground is electrically connected to the neutral, so it reads the same as the line one to neutral did. And in the grow watt system, it's uh, reading 119.7. Okay, so across neutral to ground, this will come out. It should read zero volts, but sometimes you can get a very low voltage out of it also. And that's due to either capacitance or inductance in the inverter and the wiring. Okay, and my neutral to ground is reading 0.229, um, less than three-tenths of a volt. Okay, let's check those same readings again, but this time the inverter is not bonded. There is no connection between the neutral and the ground. This is the kind of readings that we would expect. Well, again, we're going to get across line one to neutral. We're going to get 120 volts. And here on my system, I'm reading 119.8. Now, let's look at this. So line one across ground, well, we're not bonded. So there's no electrical connection. It would seem like this would be zero, but instead you're going to get 60 volts give or take uh, 10 or 15 volts. Okay, and here we're reading about 46 volts. Um, and this can be really confusing to a lot of people when you you start measuring across your, um, your uh, terminal there and you find out, why am I getting 60 volts across this? Something's wrong with this inverter. Okay, well, let's keep going. Across neutral to ground. Again, there's no connection here because we're not bonded. And that is also going to read 60 volts. Between neutral and ground, 59.7 volts. Um, those are sometimes called ghost voltages. And they are, again, due to either inductance or capacitance. Um, if you have a uh, gas power generator that is not bonded, the readings are going to be very similar on that. Okay, so let's sum it up real quick. Um, on a bonded inverter, we would expect to see 120 volts from hot to neutral. Also 120 volts from hot to ground. And between the neutral and ground, very low voltage. Now on the unbonded inverter, uh, we again see 120 volts on hot to neutral. So those two are the same. Hot to ground is going to measure 60 volts, and neutral to ground is going to measure 60 volts, again, due to inductance or capacitance. So, all we need to do is put a neutral ground bond, either in the inverter or in the breaker panel. And then all of our voltages will read the way they should. And this works on a lot of inverters, uh, especially all-in-one inverters and larger standalone. Um, things like uh, Solar. Uh, GrowWatt, uh, EG4s, um, MPP Solar, and so forth. However, you should not add a neutral ground bond to certain types of inverters. Okay, these are standalone inverters. You connect a battery, it gives you 120 volts AC out, usually through a standard AC receptacle. Okay, so on these cheap inverters, especially uh, the ones that have the AC sockets on the front, um, a lot of them are wired this way, um, and it's kind of odd. You're going to have not 120 volts coming out of the line. You have 60 volts coming out of the line. The neutral is not the return for the line. It's another 60-volt line. You can actually think of it as a, as a line 2. It works the same way that our 240-volt uh, systems work over here in North America. Uh, we'll call it a neutral because that's what it's called on here, but it works like that. It, it 
it's kind of strange. If you measure across line and neutral, it's 120 volts. It will run your circuits. You plug things in and you won't realize anything is different about this. If you measure from line to ground, it's 60 volts. And this is not a ghost voltage like it was on our unbonded inverter. This is actual voltage, 60 volts going to ground, carrying current. And here is across neutral and ground, you're also going to measure 60 volts. So if you were to bond this neutral and ground, you are constantly putting 60 volts of real voltage on your ground cable. So all of your cases, all of the, everything that's grounded in your system is now carry, is now live and carrying 60 volts. Uh, really not a good situation. The other thing is, is when you bond the neutral to the ground, it will burn up a lot of these inverters. They'll just smoke. Okay, so how could you tell the difference between a ghost voltage uh, of just a regular unbonded inverter or maybe 60 volts on the neutral that's actually live 60 volts and you do not want to bond that? Okay, so what you can do is you can take an incandescent light bulb and wire it up between the neutral and the ground. If it lights up, you have real voltage and real current going through. If it doesn't light up, you have ghost voltage. Now, if you measure voltage with a meter across this light bulb, in other words, on the neutral and the ground terminals, um, and it lights up, you'll read 60 volts. If it doesn't light up, you'll read zero voltage. This is the first inverter I bought back about 2016, and I literally knew next to nothing about grounding and bonding at the time. Um, now, this was from CNBOU, I believe is the name of the company. It does have AC outlets on it, but it also has a terminal strip. So fortunately for me, um, it's actually wired correctly. It's bonded. It puts out 120 volts. Um, I used it uh, first. I, I think I ran extension cords off the AC outlets, but I did hook the terminal strip up to a uh, breaker box and ran a few uh, outlets there. I did not try to tie this into house wiring at all. Okay, and here's a another type of inverter that you would not try to bond, and that's uh, one of these small power stations, um, and it also has AC outlets right there on the back. Um, if we measure across the hot to neutral... Uh, in this case, the battery is pretty drained. It's reading about 116 volts. However, when you try to read between hot and ground or neutral and ground, you literally get like no readings at all. It's showing me the same thing I get when the, the cables are not touching anything. So the ground is not connected at all in this. Okay, so to summarize, all in one inverters, things like BroWatts and EG4s and MPP, um, for the most part, you, you need to test it and see if it's already bonded, but it's safe to bond that system either internally or use it through a breaker panel and bond in the breaker panel. However, you have to be very careful with both the standalone inverters and the power stations. They are all over the place, and many of those are not wired up to be bonded, and it would actually be dangerous to do so. Okay, so that's about it for this video. In part three of this series, we're going to talk about using AC input. So we're going to do some grid assist, and we're also going to talk about taking the output of your inverter and interfacing with your house wiring through transfer switches. See you there.